Your name has been battered about on the internet, but you've never been officially publicly identified. Do you want to tell us who you are? My name is Michael Byrd. I'm a lieutenant for the United States Capitol Police. And on January the 6th, I was the commander for the House Chamber Section in charge of the security for the United States House of Representatives. Typically, when an officer is involved in a, in a high-profile shooting, that officer is identified publicly. Why wasn't your name identified? Um, I believe it was because of the threats, um, the vile threats, and conversations, and chatter uh, that's been expressed about me and my actions. Threats against your life? That is correct. Can you give us the nature of some of those threats? Uh, they, they talked about, you know, killing me, uh, cutting off my head, um, you know, very vicious and cruel things. Um, racist it, things? There were some racist attacks as well. Um, of course, it's all disheartening because I know I was doing my job. We're going to talk about the events of, of January 6th in a moment, but this is something I don't normally ask people that I interview, but in your case, I've got to ask you, why do you want to tell your story? Why do you want to be public now? Well, I would have liked to have come, out, uh, uh, come forth earlier, but there's a process, uh, investigative process, that must play out. Um, I was cleared by the DOJ and FBI and Metropolitan Police, and then the process can't start until that process is completed for U.S. Capitol Police to do their internal administrative investigation. But, but given the nature of the threats that you describe, do you have any concern about showing your face and identifying yourself? Of course I do. Uh, that is a very vital point, and it's something that uh, is frightening. Um, again, I believe I showed the uh, utmost courage on January 6th, and it's time for me to do that now. There's a lot of things um, that have been reported that are inaccurate and misrepresentations of my actions on January the 6th. You've got a lot built up that you want to talk about. Uh, I, I do. I do. Well, let's start with that day, uh, January 6th. What were your expectations as you headed to work that day? I was, uh, the expectations after we planned, we spent the week before uh, going through uh, our threat analysis and planning and, and uh, you know, making sure officers are aware of their assignments and their comparability with what they were asked to do for that day. Joint session of Congress uh, in, in accordance with a demonstration on the outside. I was solely responsible for uh, the joint session and the members of Congress because that was taking place in uh, my area of responsibility. So. It was a, pretty much a normal event as far as I was concerned. Uh, we did not get specific intel that would require us to change or adjust our posture. So at that point, it, it just felt like it was you know, a, a routine event that I've done over the last 28 years of my career. How many people were uh, you in charge of? How many other officers? Uh, on that day, I had about a third of what is assigned to my, uh, my unit um, as a result of COVID, as a result of uh, additional um, manpower needed to work the, um, the demonstration. So you were going in shorthanded? That is correct. From the start of the day. Did that give you any, any concerns about what might come? Always. Um, you know, I felt, again, because there was no intel indicating that uh, the requirement for more people would be necessary. I was comfortable and made sure that my team was uh, well informed and uh, prepared to handle the routine event, which is a joint session, which occurs on Capitol Hill all the time. So your job at, on, on that particular morning was to, you were in charge of the security of, of these members of Congress. That is correct. And the area that we see you in ultimately, uh, you know, when the shooting takes place, can you describe where that is in relation to the House chambers? It is essentially a part of the chamber. Uh, it's steps, literally short steps away from the actual chamber itself. If you open the doors 
and you're in the Speaker's lobby, you're essentially in the chamber. Is that where members of Congress would, would come and go? Would they come through that area? Yes, sir. I actually, uh, at the time of the incident, that there were members in the lobby with me. All right. What was your first inkling that something was going sideways? All I had was the ability to hear what was coming through my radio and what was being um, emailed to us through our phones. Um, the one thing I want to point out is America had the opportunity to watch the events of January 6th play out on television. I never had that opportunity. Um, I simply relied on the intel and information that was provided uh, through my radio. So you've got no window. That's correct. You, you, you have, you've seen none of these images of people storming up the steps or storming their way into the building. That's correct. Not until after uh, January 6th. But what are you hearing on your radio? Uh, I'm hearing about the breaches of different uh, barricaded areas, officers being overrun, officers being down, which means they were injured in some form or fashion. I have no way of knowing what the injuries were, how severe the injuries were. Uh, there was one in particular that stuck with me uh, where the officer's fingers, tips were blown off and it was literally broadcast over the air. And I said, okay, this is really getting serious. Did and you, did things you ever, have changed dramatically. Did you ever hear a call or a report of shots fired during any of this? As a matter of fact, I did. As the uh, protest escalated into a riot and the uh, protesters had breached the, uh, uh, the rioters had breached the Capitol building and they made their way towards the house side of the Capitol. Um, there was reports of shots fired through the house main door onto the floor of the chamber. And that, that turned out not to be the case? Uh, we later found out that that was not. That day, I did not find that out. But, but, but you did, at that time, you had heard that report of shots that fired. That is correct. How did that elevate you know, of course, your, your that changes level. your posture. It's part of your training. You're, you're going to, you know, your weapons are drawn. And, you know, I drew my weapon. Uh, you advised members of Congress, you know, as the breach was occurring, you know, that we need to stay away from the doors and windows, uh, get down below your seats. We tried to move them to one side or the other versus where the, uh, the riders were uh, engaging and, and gathering up. At what point did you believe there was imminent danger to these members of Congress that you were watching over? When the announcement came that the Capitol had been breached and that the uh, members of the police force were being assaulted and uh, sprayed with chemical agents. And at that time, I said, they're in the building. They're, they're, they're coming this way. I mean, when you hear the word breach, are you, are you even imagining what that looks like at that point? I could not imagine the number of people uh, until you listen to the radio and the screams and the yells for help and, uh, you know, officer down and, you know, screaming as they're being assaulted or sprayed with chemical agent. And you could hear the, uh, the cheers and the loud, you know, voices escalate as they were getting closer to my area of responsibility. Before we, we see your arm and see you now in that, in that area where people are trying to come through the door, had you talked to members of Congress and, and briefed them on the situation? Exactly. Uh, one of the things in preparation uh, to, prior to them breaching, the, the riders breaching the Capitol building, uh, it is my responsibility to inform the members of Congress, the sergeant at arms and the members of Congress that the protests had escalated into a riot and that officers were being assaulted. Uh, they were trying, attempting to breach the building. Um, they had been using chemical agents outside. There were pipe bombs found, weapons discovered and confiscated. Uh, they were using um, weapons on uh, members of the law enforcement community. So you're briefing members of Congress on, of all on of what this. you know. That's correct, as this stuff is being reported to me over the radio. What did you tell them in, in a I way told, that they could be safe? Uh, one of the things is part of our training and the exercises we conduct. Uh, I, I inform the members that they need to uh, ga gather their gas masks, which we have in a specific location uh, on the floor. and. Uh, 
instructed them at that time to be prepared, you know, how to use it and to be prepared to don the mask in the event that the, uh, the threat escalates closer to the uh, House chamber. Did you at some point uh, give them tips on how they might blend in? And- One of the things that was uh, imperative uh, as the breach had entered the Capitol building was to inform the members to remove their pens to allow them to blend in somewhat. We asked them to remove their pens. Members of Congress carry a, a pen on their lapel. They have a pen them. that identifies who they are. Um, that's part of the security initiative that allows them access uh, throughout the building. And so I'd ask them to remove their pens, to remove their jackets, you know, uh, to look like staff as much as possible, um, and to, uh, seek shelter by staying down below their chairs. You're following your training and protocol, but inside, is there part of you that's screaming that I can't believe this is happening? Of course, it was a surreal event. Um, Again, I have to rely on my training and I spent over 20 years on the chamber section alone. And every exercise, you know, has prepared me for that day and every uh, policy that we, you know, I helped, you know, write the policy, you know, or had some input. I don't want to say help write it, but had some input because of my longevity in that position, uh, working with Chamber. Um, I was a security aide there. I was an officer there. I was a sergeant there and ultimately uh, was a commander there. How long was your arc of, of service? I'm 28 year veteran. And you remain on And the I spent the majority of my time with uh, House Chambers. All right. I, w- I want to go, again, walking into these steps. As you left the House Chambers, I understand the chaplain was, was in there. Well, once I uh, concluded my uh, announcement to them, advising them of what was occurring and what you know, preparation I would like them to take, the House Chaplain uh, took my place on the podium and begin to pray with the members of Congress. And I believe it was at that point in time that not only uh, we realized this was a serious and a dangerous situation, I believe the members as well started to believe that you know, serious harm or injury could come to them. Okay, take me to the door where all this all happens. When, so, you, when you see what's happening on the other side of the door, how would you describe it? I, could not see exactly what was happening over the door because immediately when I left the podium, I went back out to assist uh, the few officers that I had in that area with me and a few members. We were making, putting up a makeshift barricade, using furniture, um, tables, whatever we could lift and put in front of the doorways um, to barricade the doors to give some type of separation from the members of Congress, ourselves, and the riders. You're with fellow officers. Yes, I had maybe two or three, you know, approximately two or three officers in that quarter with me. So you're literally trying to barricade that door. And a few members that were helping as well. Help me understand the significance of that door. If if riders get past that door, they are in the house chamber. They're in the house chamber. If they get to that through that door, they're in the house chamber and upon the members of Congress. And your task is to protect the members of Congress, staff, anyone in there? That is correct. How many people were in the chambers at that point? Any idea? Um, 60 to 80 people, approximately. Uh, And that was just members, and that's including their staff. Uh, I had a few police officers upstairs. There was a few plainclothes agents inside the chamber. Uh, There's video that later came out where you see the officers holding their weapons up uh, through the doorway. Those are your your guys? Those are part of the U.S. Capitol Police. They're not specifically my guys. I believe I had two, but the rest were um, dignitary protection uh, agents. So again, when you're at this door, it's hard to see what's on the other side, but but you're hearing things. It's impossible for me to see what's on the other side because we had created such a barricade and it was high enough that the visibility was impossible. You don't see window shattering. Until they start breaking it down. Um, It was also my understanding that 
there were officers, you know, I later found out there were officers on the other side of the door that had moved out of the way. I had no knowledge that those officers was there. I had no visual or communication with them. At this point, the radio is not helpful? There was no call over the radio uh, explaining to me that these officers were there. Uh, I don't believe they uh, tried to dispatch or inform anyone that they were present. So when the crowd begins to try to work its way through the door, which we, we've seen on, on video clips, do you feel like you're running out of options? We, we were already limited in the options that we had. Once we barricaded the doors, we were essentially trapped where we were. Uh, there was no way to retreat, uh, no other way to uh, get out, uh, because we had did both sides of that quarter. So you're essentially trapped. And uh, all of the training and policies that we have in place um, ended the same way in the 20 years that I've been inside the House chamber as, a, um, as an officer. You rely on our CERT, which is you know, our, our containment team, and if they don't make it there to uh, stop the threat, you're the last line of defense, and it's up to you to take the appropriate action based on the circumstances. And then that's where you found yourself. And that's where I found myself. Once I completed putting up the barricade, at that point is when I realized they're here. The chants got louder. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but it sounded like hundreds of people outside of that door. And then once they started knocking down all of the barricades and crashing through the doors and windows of, of, of the, um, the East Lobby, I knew at that point um, I'm yelling, I'm screaming. You know, my throat was hurting for a few days afterwards. I didn't even realize I had been yelling and screaming as loud as I was, please stop, get back, get back, stop. Um, of course, we had our weapons drawn as part of our training. Uh, you had shots fired onto the house floor. Um, you're trained to take a tactical defensive position and, you know, prepare for the threat. In, in your long career, had you ever withdrawn your weapon against a, a potential threat? There is a time, but I've never uh, discharged my weapon in the course of that action. But there has been times when we had to draw a weapon. The lawyer for the Babbitt family says that you didn't warn, you didn't offer a warning. What were you saying as you held the gun? Get back. Stop. Get back. No. Stop. Get back. Repeatedly screaming. Um, and I know it was difficult for anyone to see me verbally speaking because we were wearing uh, the masks because of COVID. But he wasn't there. I was there. And I know what I was doing. And it's possible the people on the other side of the door couldn't hear you either. It is possible. Um, I later found out through a video, you know, that one of the protesters actually yelled to all of the participants that was there, you know, trying to break in. Uh, they've got their guns drawn. Back up. Wait a minute, you know. So, um, I can't speak what they heard. I know what I was doing. I was following my policy. I was given as much warning as I possibly could. I was yelling literally at the top of my, I, I, I think I s hurt my throat because, you know, and I, of course, after the incident, I was so uh, emotional that it didn't dawn on me, you know, that that was taking place because you know, obviously that's a difficult situation and you don't sleep and you, you, you know, that I, I, I didn't think about it, but I know my throat was extremely sore and painful because I was yelling at the top of my lungs. Your actions have been reviewed by Justice Department, Capitol Police, Metropolitan Police. Um, and the United States Capitol Police. The United States Capitol Police. Have you reviewed it? Have, have you continued to question your actions that day? I knew that day I did my job and I did, I followed my training and I spent countless years and preparing for such a moment. You ultimately hope that moment never occurs, but you prepare as best you can. And I know I prepared myself 
to do the job that was required of me. I know that day I saved countless lives. I know members of Congress as well as my fellow officers and staff were in jeopardy and in serious danger. And that's my job. I'm a dedicated law, law enforcement officer. I enjoy what I do. I love the people that I work with. And that's my training. And I follow my training. What made you pull the trigger? Last resort, I tried to wait as long as I could. I hoped and prayed no one tried to enter through those doors. Um, but their failure to comply required me to take the appropriate action to save the lives of members of Congress and myself and my fellow officers. Did you, did you know who you shot? I had no clue. I didn't even know it was a female until hours way later, sometime later on that night, uh, before I even found out that it was a female. And, you know, because the call of shots fired had went out, um, you know, it was later I, you know, found out that the uh, subject did not have a weapon, but there was no way to know that at that time. And I could not fully see her hands or what was in the backpack or what the intentions of. But they had shown violence leading up to that point. And I have to ask you, I mean, based on your training, in that case, does it matter that the person was armed or not? According to law, it does not. And I would let my uh, lawyer speak on that or the United States Capitol Police General Counsel further elaborate on that. I know based on my training and my policy, uh, what I did was appropriate. Let me ask you this. After you fired, did the threat appear to cease? It did. Um, no one else attempted to enter into that hall. After the shooting, I assume your attention is also thinking about these members of Congress. I immediately reverted back to trying to get the members of Congress out of the area and to a safe location. We were given some time then after the shooting to be able to do that. Not much time. I immediately, uh, again, I wasn't the one that stayed with the subject. Again, at that point in time, my responsibility is the safety of the members of Congress. And I immediately went to try to uh, provide a safe route to, um, for an evacuation for the members of Congress and advising them which way to go and, and how to proceed. We had a few members that are, um, I don't want to say disabled or uh, have you know, um, limitations as far as being able to run or move fast. And some of those individuals were uh, directly in the lobby with me at the time of the incident. As you likely know, uh, there have been some who have elevated Ashley Babbitt to the status of a martyr. I'm curious how you react to that. I have no reaction to that. Um, I know on that day, it's, uh, there was a lot of people injured and uh, several people died. And uh, my heart goes out to everyone involved on that day that got injured or, or passed away. What should we make of the fact that there were other officers in other potentially life-threatening situations who didn't use their service weapons that day? Um, I'm sure it was a terrifying situation. And I can only control my reaction, my training, my level of expertise. I cannot speak why they would not or why they would have or should have. That would be upon them to speak for themselves. Former President Trump has, has talked about you and this, and this incident. Um, he says she was murdered. What does it feel like to hear that from a former president? Well, it's disheartening, but the only other thing I like to say to that is uh, I spent countless hours, days, months uh, doing threat analysis, doing uh, evaluations 
attending briefings, walkthroughs, um, escorts, coordinating with Secret Service that protects the president. There's pictures of me that have circulated um, that my wife was receiving during joint sessions in State of the Unions or when he was present, and I'm right there behind him. And I've escorted him on numerous occasions when he's visited the Capitol. And if he was in the room or anywhere and I'm responsible for him, I was prepared to do the same thing for him and his family. Would you have his back today if you were so assigned? I sure would, because it's my job. And he's a leader of the United States, and he deserves the same protection as the members of Congress, the current president, the Speaker of the House, you as a staffer, if you was in there, or a reporter. My job is to provide the safety and security for all of you. Member of Congress uh, described you as lying in wait. The attorney for the, the Babbitt family says that uh, you, you ambushed her. What is it like to hear those accusations, and how do you respond? Again, those things are disheartening. But I, I again, uh, you know, without having full information of what I was experiencing, what I had heard on the radio, uh, the accounts leading up to, you know, the incident, um, I can understand why they would say that, but I have to say again, I did my training to the best of my ability. Uh, the information that was provided to me, um, I tried to uh, protect members and keep them out of harm's way as best I could. When they announced shots fired, it's appropriate to take a tactical defensive stance and posture to protect myself. If I'm standing directly in front of the doorway, I could have been shot myself, possibly. A few years ago, you were investigated for leaving your, your service weapon in a bathroom. Yes. And that's been brought up by, by those who are questioning your competency. Do yeah. you want to respond to that? Sure. Uh, it was a terrible mistake. I uh, acknowledged it. I owned up to it. I accepted the responsibility. I was penalized for it and um, I moved on. We discussed this uh, at the beginning of the interview, but your name has been withheld uh, through official channels, and that's, that's unusual in, in cases where a police officer is involved in a high-profile shooting. Did you get special treatment? Of course not. No way. The threats, the vile, angry people viciously uh, attacking me without full knowledge of what my duties and responsibilities were for that day. Um, you know, there's a thing called rules of engagement. My rules of engagement never changed because I was in the presence of members of Congress the entire time. You know, there are other officers who may not have fired because they were surrounded, they were enclosed, they had a place to retreat. I had none of those advantages to me. I did not see any other thing play out you know, as everybody else did on TV. I could only rely on my radio and my training and the policies that I had in place. You were seeing this through a pretty narrow lens, as you point out, that you weren't seeing with the rest of us. But subsequently, we've all seen these montages of what happened that day. What has it been like for you to see the video now and that really depicts what was happening on that day? Uh, extremely emotional. Uh, you know, it's uh, psychologically damaging, um, dealing with counselors and have been since January the 6th. Um, there are times, you know, you know, I can't sleep, I cry out, you know. Sometimes you can't do anything but cry. Um, people, you know, you feel like you did your job and, you know, you, you, you help protect you know, our, our legislative leaders of this country. And you fought for democracy and keeping that established. Um, I'm proud of the job I do and it's hurtful, um, but you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional just thinking about the uh, the attacks, the threats, things like that.
Your, your life has been turned upside down. Yes, it has. You hoping um, to regain it? In some form or fashion, I just know that this form of life is uh, not appropriate. Not appropriate for somebody who risked his life, his livelihood, uh, to save lives of, of people that, 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 that make the laws and rules for this country. And, and you know, you, you would hope that that's enough. That man did his job. Capitol Police in their uh, press release after exonerating you said your actions potentially save members and staff from serious injury and possible death. What was it like to hear those words, to see those words? Those words meant a lot because that's exactly what I did on that day. That was my mission. That was what I prepared for. And it's, it's rewarding and refreshing to hear that. What do you want us to know, particularly critics, but all of us, what do you, what do you want us to know about what it's like to take a human life? It's always difficult. It's a decision nobody wants to be faced with in law enforcement. There's unfortunate circumstances that put you in that position and you have to have the courage, the mental fortitude to follow through with what you've been trained and prepared for. And I think I, uh, I did that to the best of my ability. As I said, your name has, has been on the internet for some time in an, in an unofficial way. A lot of rumors, a lot of accusations, one of which is that you had some sort of political motive. Um, you, were, you were a political wow. operative. Uh, that's uh, one of those things I was referring to as to why the, uh, some of the things that are being reported are just incorrect and uh, inaccurate. I do my job for Republican, for Democrat, for white, for black, red, blue, green. I don't care about your affiliation. Half of the conversations that occur inside that chamber I am not aware of because I am performing my job and making sure that I provide the utmost protection at all times for the members. Did any members of Congress acknowledge your actions either on that day or in subsequent weeks and months? There were a couple. Um, there's been one in particular, and I won't say his name because I don't want to put him in a predicament, but he knows who he is and he's been absolutely awesome and supportive for me and my family. Um, he reaches out to me frequently. He's shown uh, unwavering support and he's tried to help me in any manner that he could. Uh, there's been a few others that have spoken with my lawyer and have provided a, a little bit of uh, resources, but for the most part, I have not heard from um, or received um, a lot of support from members. Have you set foot in the Capitol since this happened? I have to do um, a walkthrough when I was going through my investigation, and that was uh, a difficult moment to go back to that, that, that point of the incident. But you've not assumed your role there. That's correct. Are you, are you anxious to get back? Are you worried about going back? Both. Absolutely. Both. Um, again, I'm a proud, dedicated, devoted, and loyal employee for the United States Capitol Police. I know I followed my training. I did what I was supposed to do to the best of my ability. And I, I, I love my job. I look forward to doing my job. I, I felt like every day I was blessed to be a part of history taking place on the chamber floor. Every day I got to see the people that run our country. Republican, Democrat, shook hands, good morning, 
you know, some I've had a cup of coffee with, things of that nature. And that never played a role to me. I know uh, there's a lot of politics involved in this now, but that was, has never been my thought process because I protect all of them. Lastly, I have to ask you, this, is, this has been absolutely devastating to the, the Capitol Police, as you know. You've lost, you've lost colleagues to yes, death by suicide. Yes. What has it been like? And, and could, could, have you thought about the damage, it's, the human damage that's just taken? It's irreprehensible, the damages, the mental stress, the emotional stress, the suffering, uh, the morale, all of those things uh, after such an event like this, you know, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time, and I hope Capitol Police uh, takes the necessary precautions and steps to uh, address those issues. Were you afraid that day? I was very afraid. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. I've learned that. Are you, are you afraid, afraid now? Afraid. Going I am. I am afraid because I know there's people that disagree with my actions on January the 6th, but I hope they understand. I did my job, mm -hmm. and there was imminent threats and danger to the members of Congress. And I, I just want the truth to be told. There's a lot of misrepresentations that either people wanted to say or people just don't understand. So I hope that they come away with something that I'm saying that allows them to uh, get more insight into what I was dealing with and what I was going through that day. And lastly, uh, if Ashley Babbitt's family is, is watching this, is there anything you would say to them? What I would like to say is to all the families from January the 6th that were injured or lost, uh, 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 that their family members received injury or loss of life, as uh, my heart goes out to them, I'm sorry for their loss and what they're dealing with. And uh, I pray that they find peace and comfort. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.